Uh, first of all, I think the reason that peak oil has not gained broader acceptance is that we're conditioned to believe that today is very similar to yesterday and that tomorrow will be like today. <clears throat> there are evolutionary reasons why we value the present more than the future and until we have evidence of some disaster or some crisis, we're very content to just go along our, our, our daily way. This is measured by the um, economic concept of a discount rate or the psychologist concept of impulsivity and it's how much uh, we put on today's value. So until people start seeing signs that actually hit them and their families in the pocket or in their lifestyle, it probably won't gain mainstream acceptance. I think peak oil could be a moderate problem or it could be a very severe problem. There are too many variables for anyone to have an accurate prediction. Uh, the way I look at peak oil is a, a kind of a normal distribution in my mind where the, the middle of the distribution is the most likely outcome, which is we're probably going to have a very deep recession and uh, some hardships around the world and maybe some wars, um, and then we're going to muddle through it and, and have some sort of positive outcome 20, 30 years from now. But on both ends of that spectrum could be really nasty population crashes or we find some you know, nuclear uh, fusion and, and things like that and, and somehow people miraculously uh, decide that they are happier with less and they, they understand that we, we don't necessarily get human happiness from more energy use and then we take that slow descent towards more local living. You know, that I'd give equal probability to the disaster scenario. So, each week when there's new information, I, I adjust my internal view, but I, I think there's a wide dispersion of outcomes, and this could be a very huge event in, in the history of, of our species. Energy return on investment, EROI, is an analog of ROI, which is a financial concept. Um, it originates in optimal foraging theory where an organism invests as little as possible energy to get as most energy out of what it eats. Like a trout swimming in the water will swim in the least turbulent eddy in order to get the bugs. As far as oil and, and how it applies to our current society is we can't just look at the gross numbers. We can't just say, oh, there's 85 million barrels a day and next year there's 86 million. We have to look at how much is available to non-energy society because energy is needed to accomplish work. We need energy in, to make hospitals and infrastructure and Disneyland and airlines and things like that. And as the uh, energy return on investment of oil, when we first started drilling it, was astronomical. We would input one barrel of energy and we would get out over a hundred. That was like in 1930s. Oil was bubbling near the ground. <clears throat> As the quality of oil uh, got uh, a little bit uh, less and it was in deeper areas, harder to find, harder to refine, more politically sensitive areas, etc., it took more energy to get that oil out. So in the 1970s that declined to 30 to 1. By the year 2000, it had declined to 10 to 17 to 1. Anecdotally, in some areas, oil has actually become an energy sink, meaning it takes more energy in joules to lift the oil out of the ground than the oil gives you. Now, as a society as a whole, we have to not become reliant on treating all energy the same because if the total net energy, which is the EROI times the scale of a particular source, declines over time. That must imply negative economic growth unless it's offset by efficiency or conservation. So it, it's very important that if we are using Saudi Arabian oil that has an EROI, an energy return on investment of 20 to 1, and we're replacing it with biofuels that have an energy return on investment of 3 to 1, we can't do that over the whole planet. 
We can do it in Ireland or in Iowa, but if the whole planet does that, that means there's much less energy for non-energy producing society. Well, uh, again, this has its origins in the evolution of species, uh, including our own, but organisms uh, under what Howard Odom, eco systems ecologist Howard Odom called the maximum power principle, uh, organize around maximum power um, from their environments. They don't optimize energy. They optimize rate times flow of energy, including ecosystems. There's a recent paper out that shows that in Puerto Rico, at every elevation gradient, the uh, net primary productivity, the photosynthesis, is optimized to take the maximal net primary productivity out of the environment, not energy efficiency. We see that in our, uh, our cars. We drive in the States at 70 miles per hour. We're optimizing time. If we wanted to optimize energy, we would drive at 40 miles an hour because you get almost double the miles per gallon uh, at, at a much lower speed. But we are, live in, a, in an environment where time is money. The more time you have, the more money you make, the more iterations of whatever your daily activities can be. I think the focus on biofuels is a, a natural instinctive reaction to the early recognition of a problem. And people want to say, ah, we've got a problem, here's a solution. But I think in the long run it will be viewed as a, uh, a wasted bullet on um, remediation and mitigation of the peak oil problem. The reason that biofuels are going to be an issue uh, is that they have incredibly low power densities to compared to the fossil fuels we use. In other words, uh, a high-rise building uh, might uh, have, uh, well, the hydrocarbons that are used for a high-rise building have 100 to 1,000 watts per meter squared, whereas biofuels have under one watt per meter squared. In other words, we need to use enormous amounts of land to generate the same amount of power that we got from fossil fuels. Secondly, um, energy is what peak oil is about, specifically liquid fuels, but as we expand the alternatives that we um, are attempting to replace liquid fuels, there's going to be other non-energy inputs that are limiting, such as water, uh, greenhouse gases, soil, um, we just completed a paper that shows that uh, ethanol, uh, which is one biofuel, has a slightly positive energy return, it, which means we, we can't replace oil at a 10 or 20 to 1 energy return with ethanol, which is a 1 and a half to 1 energy return. But the energy return on water invested is very high for fossil fuels compared to biomass. We already use in the United States, 70% of our water is used for electricity, cooling, and irrigation. So to dramatically scale biofuels, not only in the United States, but in other countries, is going to eventually uh, compete with civilian use of water. Uh, in this paper, we showed that based on UN statistics, by 2025, 66% of the world population will be completely limited to zero bioenergy production because of water limitations. So when one looks at uh, alternative energy, you can't just assume that the word renewable energy uh, connotates equal replacement. There are a lot of other uh, aspects of it that you have to consider, and water and land area are, are two of them. I think that ultimately the market will not be able to solve this problem. Um, neoclassical economics has worked on a, on a growing planet for a couple hundred years, but the tenets and the assumptions are now false. Uh, first of all, we know that uh, there's no perfect substitute for oil. Um, there are substitutes clearly, but the energy power that we get from oil 
is immense. We have 700 energy slaves walking behind us in the United States, each of us, on what our annual consumption is. Each American uses 57 barrel of oil equivalent uh, per year. Each one, each one barrel has the amount of energy in it that would take me shoveling or hauling wheelbarrows or lifting bricks 12 and a half years of physical labor. So if you multiply that, I have 700 years of energy slaves behind me. I don't also believe that the market will solve it because cognitive neuroscience, um, neuroeconomics, evolutionary psychology, lots of testing about the brain in the last few years has exploded proving that man is not a rational actor. We value the present disproportionately over the future. Um, we, and, and that's what I think is happening in the market is the hedge funds and, and people care about this quarter and this year's returns. And you might tell them about the concept of peak oil and they might understand oil is finite and might be in scarce supply by 2014, but they're not gonna go out and buy 2014 oil futures because if they do, and it's $70 right now, it may go down to $50 in the interim because of a recession and they've lost 30%. So everyone is, since I talked about earlier that we're optimizing time, I think that everything is gonna go copacetic until the 11th hour and then it's gonna go ballistic. And that's, the market is not designed for that. The market is designed for long-term discounting and, and growth. Um, if net energy declines planet-wide and we're, able, we're not able to do work, we have to conserve or increase our efficiency. Otherwise, economic growth is over. And clearly then, the market is based on debt. You have to be able to pay back interest on loans, and that's predicated on growth. If we have no growth, we have no market system. So I actually believe that in the next 20, 30 years, what humans strive for right now, we compete. We're born to compete but we need to change the metric by which we compete. I believe that financial capital and political capital is what we compete for now, but that's gonna broaden out into another portfolio. Financial capital might exist a little bit, but that's gonna be built capital, which is windmills or buildings or uh, you know, gardening structures. Um, social capital, the friends that you're with, the community, um, a network of people that, that have common interests. Human capital, which is knowledge, how to do permaculture, how to uh, save water, um, how to generate energy from the trees on your property. And natural capital, of course, which is productive ecosystems that have biodiversity, uh, um, biomass growth, water, uh, just the entire hydrological cycle. I think humans, once we understand um, our place on the planet and we use systems ecology and are not so arrogant to believe that it's the human's planet to do whatever we wish, that we'll understand some of these other ways of, of measuring our worth rather than just in dollars.